Philip? You're not, your name is not Philip, sorry. <laughs> is, this, is this his first day in the job? Or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you look like a Philip. He, he, he didn't recognise you without a helmet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Punters Panel brought to you by the From the Horse's Mouth podcast. That's a mouthful, if ever there was. And my name is Paddy Parr. I'm delighted to be joined by Patrick Mullins, Fran Berry and trader extraordinaire Joe Logue. See, I have to, wait, I have to look at my notes there to see my own name. Anyway, um, Punters Panel is, of course, a show where we take questions from our dear viewers. And with the Chapman Festival looming large, we've got some crackers here for you lads today. Uh, we get stuck into those in a moment, but before we begin, some quick housekeeping. Uh, firstly, if you're listening to this as a podcast, I'm obliged to tell you that you can also watch it on the Paddy Power Racing YouTube channel and subscribe to the channel while you're at it. And secondly, we do have Cheltenham tickets to give away. So all you have to do is leave a comment on this video uh, to be in a chance of winning those tickets. We'll be picking two lucky winners to each win a pair of tickets to Paddy Power Stairs Hurdle Day at Cheltenham, which is, of course, the Thursday. Uh, last but not least, if you're having about it at Cheltenham or indeed any day, please do remember to gamble responsibly. Right, let's start off. Is everybody ready? Yeah? She's the enthusiasm, lads. Dripping out of you. <laughs> dripping out of you like sweat <laughs> off a horse after a three mile chase in 50 degree heat. Anyway, right, first up we've got our good friend of the show, Vernon, who's getting straight into it, Patrick, with three quick fire questions for you. Three quick questions for Patrick. Um, how suited to the National Hunt chase does he think Embassy Gardens will be? Will Ashro Diamond take on stablemate Lossy Mouth? Surely not. And I liked what I saw when Maureen won by 11 lengths at Punchestown, but I see there's no entry for Cheltenham. What does Patrick think of Maureen and what's the plan, if any, going forward? Right, Patrick, three questions there. First of all, National on Chase, Embassy Gardens. Uh, yeah, look, he obviously... Last year he ran way too keen in the Abra Bartlett, but that start is very different. Uh, it's a big field, it starts on a bend, which means everyone gets jig joggy. It's downhill to the first fence and it's always a cavalry charge and that just blew his head. The National Chase start is much different since they brought in the new rules uh, in 2018. It's always a smaller field, um, obviously not everyone's not as much of a rush over three miles six. Um, so I think he should settle. He's only had two runs, usually you'd like to have more runs, but again, it's a different race now since the new rules come in. It's a smaller field, experience isn't as much of a, um, an advantage. Um, so he looks like he jumps, looks like he settles. I wouldn't be worried about him running bad at the track last year. He has to have a huge chance. Okay, what I'm taking out of that is jig joggy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's probably a positive nod for Embassy Gardens. Uh, Astro Diamond uh, has taken on Lassie Mouth. Yeah, uh, she was really good in Doncaster. Um, I'm a mass fan of this mare. I think the only six horses who have beaten her over hurdles are all grade one winning geldings. Um, Marine National, Irish Point, Imperi Pass, Tiopu, Fast La Vega, Elete Thompson. They're six serious horses. And uh, obviously Lassie Mouth is going to be very hard to beat, but uh, Astro Diamond back against mares. She's had two runs. Um, she didn't get to go to Cheltenham last year, but uh, I think she's really high class mare and last mate won't have it all her own way. Okay, well, that's interesting. And uh, Maureen, what's the plan going forward? Yeah, she came out of punch really well. Um, we're really happy with her. The bumper entries aren't obviously out yet, but um, she'll be entered in that. Now, look, there's obviously there's such a great mares program. You've got Fairy House, Aintree, and Punchdown all kind of late March and April. So she could go there, follow the Astro Diamond route. Um, but at the moment, she still is a possible for Cheltenham. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for that. Okay, next we have Paddy, not me, with a question for Fran. Um, Paddy. All right, lads. Question for Fran. If you were a stable jockey for Willie Mullins, what way would you split up the novice hurdlers and novice chasers? So, Fran, uh, what way would you split them? And then we'll ask uh, Patrick afterwards whether you get a job or not. Very, very simple uh, equation to work out, isn't it? You know, what's Willie Mullins going to do? Five to ten Sunday morning de before declarations, say... <laughs> He might know, or he'll tell us, tell somebody, but he's got to make a decision by 10 o'clock Sunday. Look, Starboard Supreme, I was blown away by Ballyburn at the Dublin Race Festival. The way he travelled, the way he went through the race, I just thought it was very, very taken. And I thought, there's no way, based on that performance, that you'd step him up and trip. I thought the way he tanked down the back straight for Paul, the way he picked up, I can't see any reason why you wouldn't go for the Supreme Novice with him. Then you throw mystical power into the equation and... 
Bought at Galway, okay, and he beat Samu, he wasn't it, but uh, in the Moscow Flyer when he won at Punchton also. He's got that overdrive, the last furling and a half, and he really gets going. Just as jumping is slick enough for Supreme Novice, is only running Galway's over easy fix hurls. He's running Punchton first run over conventional hurls. So he stretch him out and trip to allow for not being a slick a jumper, or lack of experience maybe, would be an interesting one. And where he'd step up and trip, I think I'd go longer with the jumping in mind, maybe mystical power. Bally Burn looks maybe the more finished article at this stage. Now we did see 25 years ago now, Easter Brack and Finnegan's Hollow separated for various reasons like that. And uh, not saying mystical power doesn't have the speed, but maybe jumping wise, stretching him out and trip would suit. And then you throw Tully Hill into the mix, who's only got one entry in the Supreme Novice, but there is a uh, supplementary stage, isn't there? So on the 7th of March, which not, I can't remember any horse being supplemented for different races of challenge, particularly novices, but it is another equation after winning a punch stand last week. So that's Supreme. The Bering Bingham, the Albert Bartle, where they start. One horse I'm really interested in, Get Patrick's thoughts. Biller K. Dickey, is it, that won in Punchestown. I thought he was ultra impressive. And he's 20 to 1 and 12 to 1 for two novice hurls. Winner of the flat in France over a mile and a half, won over two and a half over hurls. He just could be won at a double figure price that could be an each way of proposition wherever he goes. But I'll start with Supreme, that's what I'd be thinking. And Dancing City, wherever he goes, I think uh, the Albert Bartle would look very suitable. Lecky Watson, though, at a double figure price, he's probably a stare in the making. Uh, outran his odds in the champion bumper last year as well, but it's a lot of equations going to mix. But start with Supreme Novice Hurl. I think uh, Bally Burns the one I'd love to ride there. Mystical power with a jumping mind, step him up and trip to the Bering Bingham. Okay, Patrick. Uh, yeah, um, simple really. Um, look, Bally Burns could go either way. He, he's not your natural two miler. But neither was Champagne Fever, uh, and ridden appropriately, he won the champ he won the Supreme. Votor wasn't really a two miler, he ridden appropriately he won it. So um but he could go like Sir Garrett, he could go two and a half. I think he he's good enough to win either race. Um Mystical Power, yeah, his jumping, he's not a natural jumper. He is a Galileo, they they probably often aren't. Um he, he can race quite keenly. And funnily enough, that two and a half mile race, they end up going quite slow in a couple of years and just I don't know about running keen there. Um, to me, he looks like a supreme horse. Um, he'll travel. I think he'll. I think he'll, he'll jump and will improve from as you say. Was that, that was his first one over conventional mm -hmm. hurdles. This will be his first one over white hurdles. But um, uh, anyway, <laughs> and it could be in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I suppose the fact that he's a JP horse and Mark's going to ride him. You know, Willie's not going to be trying to split them up to get Paul on both of them. Um, that's probably a factor as well. Um, I think Reed and Tommy Wrong, Ill Antique, they both kind of look like, to me, the Baring Bingham horses. Uh, Dancing City High Class Hero look like the Albert Bartle horses to me. Um, if Again, if you're looking at horses that's going to be outside the obvious, I thought Mr. Giff was impressive in Limerick. Um, to me, he looks like a supreme horse. He's quite, he's a flat winner. He's quite fast. Billericky Dicky could be a similar type. Um, very hard for both of them after one run, I suppose, but it, it, it has been done. Five for three did it. And that's people wondering about Willie making his mind up. I only know of Willie having two bets that I've ever heard of. And one was 5-4-3 to win the Supreme. And he ran him in the, the two and a half. <laughs> so that's what you're up against. <laughs> the other one was Rule Supreme to win the Gold Cup and he ran him in the stairs. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I thought uh, was Mr. Giff maybe in the Supreme could be, uh, you know, if you're looking for one at a bigger price. And I, I think Predator's Gold, he, the Baron Bingham looks the right one for me. Like he's... Very much a bit of a Goldilocks. He was he was just not quick enough for two miles. At Christmas two six was a little bit too far. I just think two five on good ground um, at ten or twelve to one. I think he's and a horse who's quite unexposed, still improving. Um, he could be one at a price in that. And so, is there one of them that you kind of go, oh, like you'd be licking your lips, whatever race it goes? Is there one novice that stands out? Sure, look, to me, Bally Burn is the obvious one, but I do think Reading Time Wrong hasn't got the credit he deserved in Nace. I know Willie was saying that, you know, Il Atlantique has to do the hard work. I didn't see it like that. Il Atlantique got to set his own fractions. Now, we flew down over the first, and my lad missed it, and we went quick to the second, my lad missed it again, and suddenly Paul's left in front on his own, getting to set his own fractions. So, to me, then, reading Tom Wrong's had to make up all that ground. Now, he got a great run, he got a great ride, but I would actually mark him up, and um, he settles so great. He's a very simple ride. Uh, he's underrated. Okay. Just on the chasers, Facel Vega, tripwise, could Vega, her two best career performance of three miles in Punchdown, 
Are we going to go up and trip at Cheltenham? I, I, to me, I, to me, he he wants to go up and trip. Um, and you know, as you say, Cavega won six times over two and a half and four times over three miles. And to me, his jumping just isn't slick enough for a real two mile chaser. So I'd love to see him up to two and a half. I'd even I wouldn't mind seeing him up to three miles because he actually settles. He gets quite hot in the ring and he's quite hot when he's waiting around. But when in the race, he settles very well. And the way he jumps, to me, he wants to go up and trip. But um, I have to see if Willie agrees. Just just on Fasil Vega, Patrick, do you take anything out of like Leperson? He got beaten there as a novice hurdler, and then he got beaten as a as a novice chaser there as well. Do you think it's maybe a Leperstown thing, and he should improve for Chelham, or is it just coincidence? Not necessarily. I mean, he w he did win a Grade One hurdle in Leperstown, and, and you know the, when he got beat there in his in his hurdle, it was you know the Joseph horse took him on. They just they they, they cut each other's throats, and he won his bumper in Leperstown. Um, I, I think I think just and then his two defeats there this year. They've been slow run races because, you know, with another horse, with him, you'd love to maybe send him on, let him stride on, let him um, use his jumping. But he, because he jumps a bit careful, he's always just losing that half length. And I just think boat races have turned into a sprint. I don't think he's a bit, I don't think he's a really fast horse. Um, I don't think it's a Leperstone thing, but I could be wrong. And okay. We'll see, we'll see Gaelic Warrior and Ferios. Uh, well, if you can think of time, Willie, <laughs> Willie, <laughs> Willie skipped Cheltenham at one. But, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, it, it could all happen, but um, I think Cheltenham is Cheltenham to William Rich. <laughs> right. Um, okay, listen, uh, we Cormac for Joe now. Um, Cormac for Joe. Question for Joe. From a trading point of view, what horse would you most like to see get beaten at the festival? Is there one result which would be the biggest loss? Thank you. Well, Joe, I know you're a kind-hearted soul. You'd never want to see anything get beat, particularly, but uh, you get his point. Which one is going to be the worst result for us? Yeah, when I was here for the punters panel for the DRF, I gave her three biggest losers, and they still are three biggest losers. It's uh, Burdett Road for the Triumph, um, Jericho de Repine for the Supreme, and the Real Wacker for the Gold Cup. <clears throat> and they've all been beaten next time out, so we're in a pretty good position there. We were laying much under the odds in the price they are now. So, look, we still have that liability. There are three biggest losers, but we're happy enough with, I suppose, we were laying under the odds. Um, since the DRF, uh, T-Shan for the champion bumper has been a big springer in the market. We laid him as big as 25. He's now 6-1. to one. Look, Nichols speaks very highly of him. Uh, he was impressive at Exeter. He won by seven lengths that day. He was weak in the betting, which was interesting. And Tom Malone has come out publicly and said he's the best horse he's ever bought out of a point-to-point -point field. So he's our biggest loser of the last month. He'll probably be a, a big loser on the day if he shows up. Obviously, um, Captain Teague was third in the champion bumper last year. So look, if you can replicate that, it's a, it's a big sweat for us, Cheltenham champion bumper. Okay, great. Uh, now, Andrew, a good friend of the show, has one for everybody. Hi guys, it's Andy in sunny Wolverhampton here. I hope you're all well. Um, I've got a question for the whole panel today. What's your best bets in the handicaps this year? Uh, Fran, I'm particularly aiming this one at you, I suppose. What's the green and gold good thing? Go on, let us in. Well, Fran, will we start with you? Yeah, I, my, I rang my dad on the way up here, actually, and um, we did a long conversation and basically all he wanted me to do was book his golf tea time in for Monday so, <laughs> so uh, at the Curra Golf Club. So Is when he well made, handicapped? Uh, <laughs> he usually takes a tenner off Kevin Pendergast every okay. Monday. That's their routine. There's four of them to play. Uh, he, he tell you he isn't, but he probably is. But uh, on the JP team, two hours to stand out to me and one is actually declared Ronnie Kempton uh, this weekend. No ordinary Joe, uh, second to Oroco last year in the Martin Pipe, ran into one on the day, of course, stable com ownership companion. Yet to hit the same form, but I just would watch him with interest and see how he performs and does he go to the Coral Cup or back for the Martin Pipe. He's interesting and uh, a horse that went on the radar in Limerick uh, completely and didn't show up at all in the Dunn Race Festival on his handicap chase debut, but a tough task. Gavin Cromwell's horse, I know the way you're thinking. I think he's very well handicapped as a novice, wherever he, whether it's Cheltenham, maybe into an Irish national, something like that, but he's a six-year-old. He's very likely raced over hurls. Got a hell of a lot of potential, I think, over fences, and uh, I'll be very interested to see where he goes. He's all he's in the Kimur, and he's also in the Ultimate, but he worried, worried scra scrape into Kimur. He'd be very interesting. Okay, so no no ordinary Joe, and I like the way you're thinking. Yeah, Grant. I know the way you're thinking. I know the way you're thinking. Joe? Um, I'm hoping Patrick gives me the vote of confidence here. I was doing the handicaps during the week and uh, listening to Gar Fortune. I thought it was interesting in the Martin Pipe. Um, look, he's by Soldier Fortune to start him out over two miles, six, three mile. Dropped him back then on his third start at two mile uh, maiden hurdle, and he's behind reading Tommy Wrong. Uh, Staffordshire or not was in third. I think he's a good horse and maybe didn't handle the track at Turles the other day. Um, and walk away Harry for Charles Burns is in fourth and he won a Punchestown bumper last season and probably one that would spring up in a big handicap at some stage and look by the end of the season I think that form could look very good he came out and won next time out then 
Uh, so he has his four runs. He doesn't have a mark in Ireland or in England, so I wouldn't be one to be backing right now, but I think he's top of my list if you know if you get the green light from Patrick maybe. Well, does he get the green like Razzy Erasmus up in the in the stands during the Rugby <laughs> World Cup? <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely. Like he's 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 a nice horse, and his first two runs, you said maybe we were going too far with him, and um, but his running cork behind reading Tom wrong that was very good, and then he backed it up then in punch down. So uh, I won a lander of bumper on him maybe three years ago now, and he's always been a you know he's always been a precocious horse, always been very talented. So with four runs, he's unexposed, and uh, as you say, what mark he gets would be interesting. Okay, you can also answer the question as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, there was two, I suppose. Um, I, thought, I thought Sam would just be interesting to see what mark he gets in England. Um, he's a horse, he's a beautiful horse. Should appreciate good ground, better ground. Now, I know he won in Limerick at Christmas, which is the worst ground that you can win on, so maybe that won't be the case. But he beat Noble Yates. Um, that, I think, you know, that form was obviously Frank. Noble Yates probably did improve for the run. Um, but he'll be interesting to see where he goes. We fancied him a lot in punch down last year, and he disappointed it was his first run this season, um, or his first run for us. But uh, again, he's unexposed. Um, I would give Old Castle a Mott another try. Whether he's going to get in, he might be too, actually too low, possibly to get in. But that was a big ask in the Betfair. First run for us, first run in England, Ireland, first run of the season. Um, he didn't run bad, having to get reshod beforehand. He was very relaxed for a lot of it, but he did get wound up for the last couple of minutes. That's not a help. So whether he gets in or not is the question. And uh, Keita Bourbon is another one that could be interesting. He's two from two, so he, he does stand out. Um, but he's a horse that races like you want a nice handicap at the race. I think he only does what he has to. And I think there could be improvement in him. True, victim of your own success in the two horse for their accident rather than design. State man galloping the Shams winning the handicaps. You've got to have four runs to qualify for a handicap mark now as well. Yeah, and I actually think it probably should be more. I think handicap should be for handicappers. I think novices should have to run in novice races. I think that would make everything more competitive. Um, you know, the Grand National have to have six runs. Should that be the same for those premier handicaps? Um, yeah, the state man rule was was brought in. Um, and you know, when you see, I don't know, sometimes when you see O'Castle Moss, Gaelic Warrior, uh, getting handicapped off the French form, like, is that very hard or...? Um, I, I just do think the handicap system at the moment, it's always novices winning it. And is that fair? Maybe not. Mm. Okay. Uh, next, we have Sam, who's got a question for you, Patrick. Question for Patrick. From a riding point of view, who are the lads to keep on your side in the boys' races at the festival? Um, or ladies, um, whichever. Either. I think what he meant by boys' races is like for amateur riders and conditions and that kind of thing. Nearly, nearly, not quite. Yeah. Uh, for conditional riders, yeah. yeah, no amateurs allowed. So basically, course, young yeah. claiming claim professionals, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, the, in England, they call them boys races. In Ireland, we, we, we wouldn't call we just call them, they're usually Martin sounds or their manners. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, so look, Danny Gilligan is the obvious one. So Danny, top, top quality, top class. Um, Mark McDonough rides out for us once a week. He's having a fantastic season. Um, really, really clever guy, did his, did his college course and um, is riding out with skin. And then we have Kieran Callahan who rides for us. Um, he's only 19 or 20, he didn't point a race, didn't point a point, so he's still a young, improving jockey, but got a lot of natural talent, good set of hands, um, and I think we'll be utilising him. Okay, so would you, well, you know the Irish better than the English, I guess, but uh, you'd be confident about some of the young Irish jockeys? Yeah, uh, yeah. look, to be honest, I, I, I don't know, I wouldn't have seen many of the English fellas riding, but I think there's a good crop of young Irish fellas there, but I think, you know, Danny and Mark are the two, top two at the moment. Grant, okay, perfect. Uh, now we're back with Vernon, who has a question for Fran. Fran, um, I'm with Rory Delaghi and being very keen on the chances of brighter days ahead in the Mayor's Novices Hurdle, but some people are doubting that she has the experience required to win a big race at the Cheltenham Festival. I'm wondering, Fran, how vulnerable is a, a lesser race horse, a horse simply that's not as experienced as some she will face? How vulnerable is she to the electric atmosphere at Cheltenham? Okay, Fran, <laughs> <laughs> brighter days ahead. Um, it's a good question, but you won't know till you go with a horse. Um, she was very, very impressive at Navin, the way she went through the race and put daylight between herself and her other rivals. She's learning run to run she's learning and improving with racing and she looked really like the finished article in Navin but you don't know till you get to challenge for a, a young mare young filly it can be a little bit daunting one thing she's got in her favour probably and Patrick might expand on this is that she runs on a, 
likely to run Thursday in the mayor's office hall, I would imagine. And uh, she could arrive into Cheltenham on the Monday and she's going to experience a lot of the hustle and bustle from a distance, if you like, in the stable yard. They may well even go down to Parade Ring after racing on the Tuesday, just have a walk around and get a feel for the whole thing. So I wouldn't be a worry. I wouldn't be a worry for me. Now, again, if you see her going to start that she's boiled over this white sweat on her, you're in trouble and you'll owe your fate after the first hurl. But at this point in time, given the experience of Henry, or experience of the trainers, Gordon, uh, to get her to the track and know what it takes to get there, I wouldn't be worried unless I've seen something negative in the lead up to the race in the moments when the jockey gets on board. Patrick, do you do, like, do you do that? Are there particular horses, maybe the younger horse, I guess, but that you'd be worried about? So, do, like, I was, I'm was, interested to hear you're allowed to do that. First of all, you're at Cheltenham that early. Like, I'm sure they have enough, it's like a hotel. They have to, like, clear the stables out to get more horses in. And secondly, you're allowed to go down and just have a wander around on the days you're not racing just to get used to it. Yeah, um, yeah. There's there's, there's two yards. The top yard, top yard, the Irish yard, which is kind of a, a temporary one, and then there's the main stable yard. So you you are swapping in and out. Some people arrive early. Some people arrive on the day. Um, you know, obviously the English horses arrive on the day, so they don't see it beforehand. But yeah, we get our first horses land in the Tuesday horse land in Saturday, the Wednesday horse land in Sunday, and and so on. Um, so they do get to to hear the microphones and the crowd and all that. Um, you know, the fact that she ran in, she ran an 18 runner bumper, you know, that she's had that big field experience, she's had plenty of runs. And the one thing about the Mayor's Novice is it's like how the all the Cheltenham races used to be. It's a big field. Mm. So there is that, like I was saying, the Ochi Albert Bartlett as well, you know, there is that big field. So do you jump off handy, get a posse, but get all hustle and bustle um, and jig joggy beforehand? Or do you, <laughs> do you drop in and get relaxed, but then risk run, running in the traffic? And you don't see that anymore in the Triumph or the Supreme or the Barring Bingham but in the Albert Bartlett and the Mayor's Novice and the Champion Bumper, because they're big fields, what Cheltenham used to be, that is an extra, those races are slightly harder to ride. They're much harder to ride. And there is more of a chance of a horse, you know, running keen, boiling over or getting stopped. So it is a concern, but is it a concern for her particularly? I don't think so. As a jockey, I'm interested in that as a jockey. So is that you're unlucky or at the start, is it real? I, I want to be on the inside here. Do you decide before where you want to be? In the race, like say, if, say with the big field, say in the bumper or whatever, you, you say, okay, well, I want this fella to be handy or it's a hold up horse or whatever it might be. Is that all about your position at the very start? Well, different jockeys are, are have different uh, ways of doing it. I was talk, talking to Derek O'Connor, I was interviewing him, and he was saying, he, you know, when he gets to Cheltenham, he doesn't mind where he is at the start. He just slots in where he's happy, where he's comfortable, where his horse is relaxed. I'd be the opposite. I want to get down if I want to be on the inside of the horse because maybe he jumps left or maybe because I want to get cover or because I think the best ground is there. Um, you know, but it's the law of the jungle at the start. There's no like, you don't get down there and, you know, I'm here, you're there. Um, so different jockeys, different races and different types of horses. Some horses, you know, you're just happy to take where it's comfortable. But if you have a horse that wants to be in front, or wants to be on the inside or wants to be mid-div, third or fourth behind the leaders, there could be four or five other lads doing the same. And, you know, you might have to squeeze in or you might have to hold your position. And of course, doing that, you're getting your horse revved up, more excitable. Um, so that's, uh, it, it, there are un, uncertainties at the start that you have to try your best to get in the best position. Okay. Right, uh, we're going to take a break now, so we'll be back right after this. Introducing Paddy Power's new money-back tokens for racing. The flexibility to choose the race in which you get your money back offers. Claim your token via the homepage banners or through the promotions page. Add your selection to your bet slip from any eligible money-back race. Apply the money-back token to the selection. Choose your stake and place your bet. Easily track the horses on which you've used a money-back token in My Bets. Get your money back as a free bet if the horse finishes second, third or fourth. Get brand new money-back tokens with Paddy Power. Welcome back to Punter's Panel. I am contractually obliged to tell you to subscribe to the, for the Paddy Power Racing YouTube channel. If you don't subscribe to it, your computer will self-destruct in 10 seconds. Okay, next we have Philip with a question for Patrick. Hi all, Philip here all the way from Melbourne. Um, I just have a quick question for Patrick. Just wondering which ride are you looking forward to most at this year's Cheltenham Festival? Thanks. Philip? You're not, your name is not Philip, sorry. <laughs> is, this, is this his first day in the job? Or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You look like a Philip. He, he, he didn't recognise you without a helmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Patrick? 
Uh, I'm really looking forward to riding Billaway. Um, might be the most obvious answer, but like uh, this is probably his last year. He's I've ridden him for the last six years. You know, he ran such a great race um, at Nace the other day. Um, I was gutted we didn't get up. Uh, he gave me a horrible fall in the race last year when he just headbutted the fence down the hill. But we put blinkers on him two days last year. He fell with me in Cheltenham and then he unseated me in um, Punchdown. So blinkers obviously are no no. And, you know, I, I think I think he's run, you know, he won before Cheltenham and Punchdown last year. He won after it. And then he's never won first time out. He got within a short head of it's on the line. If he could re regain the um, Fox Hunter crown at 12 years old, uh, that'd be class. And he, he's not an easy ride. Like, he's just. He should, like he's twelve years old, he should be he should be push button stuff, but he just he takes out of badger and his jumping can be in and out. Um, but I like his idi idiosyncrasies, so he's the one I'm most looking forward to riding. So you sound like you just described a horse as a complete pain in the arse to ride, and you can't wait to ride him. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. I, I don't, I'm happy I don't ride him every day, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I do like riding him on the track. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Bill away in the Fox Hunters after the Gold Cup. Uh, now, Joe, you've been quiet for a while, so wake up there now. We got one for you from Andrew. Hi gents, my next question is for Joe. Uh, Joe, three of the four championship races this year have got heavy odds on favourites. Uh, does this like lessen the betting interest in the races or is everyone stacking them into the multiples? How's the book looking on those? Hi right, Joe. Um, yeah, the multi-question first is, is interesting. It's something that's, I suppose, been more popular the last few years as kind of the race programme with Cheltenham has got more spread out and there's more short price favourites. But um, yeah, look, El Fabiolo, Constitution Hill and, and Galpin de Champ are the three championship odds on favourites that is Andrew is it is, is referring to. So yeah. um yeah, look, they're gonna be a popular treble throughout the week and if you put a five or a tenner on, you're not gonna get much back. But you know, the sheer volume of, of business that we have over Cheltenham, it's gonna cause plenty of headaches for us and, and we'll have kind of a risk team that will be, you know, focused on day race books but also monitoring the multis because you know, the uh, liabilities can get pretty big pretty quickly on them, especially, you know, if, if Willie rattles through the first two favourites and wins on the Tuesday, then we're going to have huge run-ups away from the championship races. But I think in terms of a betting interest as well, like if, if there's an unbackable favourite for, you know, a, a working man, you know, trees on, fours on, anything like that, you know, very few would back it. If there's not an each-way option against it, you know, that kind of leaves people a bit stuck. It's kind of difficult. Cheltenham maybe is a little bit of an exception to the rule I, you know we all know people that will save money and put away money to have a bet in every race at Cheltenham just because it's such a huge occasion occasion and the biggest week of the year but I think you know not to be all doom and gloom but if National Hunt Racing serves up short price favourites and small fields throughout the season and then we get to Cheltenham and it's kind of more the same you could potentially see that betting interest maybe falling down a small bit in the next few years but at the moment it's okay Cheltenham is, is the exception at the moment. Would you say it's all the Mullins' fault? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. I think, I think, like you look at yards, like you know, <laughs> the Mullins yard and, and Nicky Henderson and things. You know, they huge, huge owners there, and and like you know, Cheltenham is is the target. And you know, I think these days, you know, I don't know, I don't train horses nor have any insight to it, but I presume with you know the technology and, and the insight you have these days, it's much easier to prepare a horse and target him for Cheltenham. That's what you know the big trainers are doing, and that's what the big owners want, and and that's the name of the game. And Look, that's just part and parcel of it, really. Look, Willie has to do his, his job and, and we'll do ours, but look, hopefully we can find a compromise somewhere in the middle anyway. I'm only taking the mick, Eddie, by the way. Before, <laughs> before you walk out, it's not your fault you're good at your job, Jesus. Uh, right, uh, Matthew for Patrick. Okay, folks, I've got a question for Patrick. Now, Cheltenham Festival winner, what are the pros and cons of buying a horse out of France or an Irish point-to-point -point winner? Willie Mullins seems to be going down the French route Patrick, the negatives and the positives. I'll just repeat the question because I'm sure you were distracted by his the fact that he borrowed his granny's coat. But uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, why why buy from France basically versus buying out of the Irish point to point scene or something like that? Uh, well, the negative is that I can't ride most of the ones that come to France, so that's not a good thing. But um, look, a couple of reasons. One is you can buy in euro because um, it's you know, very strange. You know, you buy point to pointers in, in sterling, and when you buy in Wexford, you buy in sterling as well. So they seem to have gone Jeez, over. I didn't to, know that. Really? Yeah, yeah. They only use sterling in Wexford. Um, <laughs> so it's a bit cheaper and obviously you're not buying at the sales so you can buy privately so a lot of people yeah. you know don't want their horse to have a big um, uh, sales price mm. you know and obviously the point of point guys have to go to the sales with a lot of their horses because they bought them from the sales and there's all sorts of agreements going on but being able to buy private and in Euro in France is definitely an advantage um, I think for us personally we, just, we had a lot of good contacts in France you know we used to go to France um, you know even back to Don Rome winning an toy Pierre Boulard um, is a fantastic contact to have there. So we have a lot of relationships there. 
Um, and, you know, as well, you're buying them out of, they're buying them from the racetrack, which is perhaps, you know, it's more professionally ran, obviously, than, than a point to point. And, uh, you know, some people have more, a little more confidence in that. But diff, diff, we have lots of success from point to pointers as well. Mm. Edgar Gabin came out in English point to point, didn't he? He's French bred, sold in Ireland, won an English point point and came back, came back here. Yeah. So, uh, look, it's 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 there's different reasons, but I think really we just we happen to have a lot of good relationships and contacts in France. Just on that, Patrick, you know, you were saying about the sales houses having agreements, and obviously, if you're a seller, you're looking to win first time out and and you know try and get back you know a bit of profit to run your business. Like, do you think it has an impact on horses like being drilled to win first time out, like Willie, uh, and your operation? buy a lot of placed horses like Album Photo fell tree out and, and you're looking at horses that potentially can place and have scope to improve and that you can improve. Do you think there's a pro and con of, you know, buying a horse first time out or, or something that you can work on? Um, yeah, look, I think there is an advantage to the four-year point of points that we are getting horses ready or quicker, you know, rather than waiting until they're five and six. Um, I think the point of point lads are, are good at not drilling them, um, you know, but there is obviously, they're only maybe, we're only maybe doing this in Ireland for maybe 10 years, whereas in France they're doing this for the last 30 or 40 years. So maybe they have a slightly better way of training younger horses, but the point of point lads do, do, do a fabulous job. We've had lots of success from the point of point lads. Um, and I was going to say something else, what, what was the other part of the question? Just about placed horses. Oh like, yeah, yeah. Know, so scoped and proved. Originally, like when we started buying horses, say 15 years ago, like Paul Nichols would have gone in and he'd buy the winner in our toy. And we wouldn't be able to afford that. So we started buying horses down the country. So winning maybe in the likes of Tremor or Clamel in France, which would be like under so, um, Cuvega. And or buying horses that were placed, and that was purely because we could, uh, you know, we we could afford them, whereas we couldn't at the time we couldn't afford the the winners. Um, and also, when you buy a placed horse, you're able to come over here and win a maiden, so you can start and work up. It's much harder when you buy a winner. Um, you know, obviously, I think Gallop and the Shams and Duvan were able to come. Well, Gallop and the Shams, it took them the whole season to get to get into the swing of things. But um, if you have to start off in winners races, there's not a lot of winners races in Ireland. You nearly have to go straight to graded races. And it's just not an ideal start to your time here. So there is pros to, to buying horses that have been beaten. They're, they're slightly cheaper as well. Um, and if you can look at a horse that maybe pedigree-wise or physique-wise might be long-term better than the horse who won, might have a sharper pedigree or a smaller physique. Sorry, you just said at the start there that you can't ride the ones from France. Is that just not like French things? or? Uh, no, big fan of the French. Um, but... Uh, the, if they ran on, if they ran in a bumper in England, uh, or sorry, if they ran a bumper in France, or they ran over hurdles as a three-year-old, then they can't run the bumpers here. Um, so I can't ride them in bumpers. I can ride them, of course, in, yeah. in in professional races. But if there's the odd one, say Alaho had ran in a four-year-old race in France, a four-year-old hurdle, so he was able to come back and run the bumper. I managed to get him beaten a bumper, but um, uh, normally they're not eligible for bumpers. Okay. Fair enough. Right, uh, we have Vernon again bringing up the hat trick. Another one for you, Joe. In recent years, I'm proud to say I've managed to tip up winners at 50 to 1 and 28 to 1 at the Cheltenham Festival. But I think with each passing year, it gets more difficult to find one at a big price. Now, can Joe spot one in the anti post market right now? Something he thinks is overpriced, even taking into account the non runner money back offer with Paddy Power. And I wonder. What happens at Paddy Power Towers when their colleague Frank Hickey, the man himself, tips up one at a big price? Does Joe or his colleagues, do they, what do they do? Do they run for cover and slash the price about that horse? Okay, Joe, that felt a bit like just an excuse for a massive flex by Vernon. Um, so he did be a trumpet in the back <laughs> yeah, of there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should get him on the panel next yeah, year. Yeah, he's thinking I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. individual winners, but uh, you get his point. Is there not a big price there? Uh, yeah, at, at the moment, it's it's a bit difficult. We've gotten non-runner money back at the moment, so the prices are maybe a bit condensed um, with the fact that if the horse doesn't show up, you get your stake back, obviously. But um, I was looking through it and thought Cool Survivor was interesting. Um, Again, he's entered in the Ultima, the Plate, and Kim Muir. And, you know, if you want to take a swing anti-post, uh, Gordon seems to like to have one for the Kim Muir. Um, look, he was sent off joint favourite for the Martin Pipe uh, last year off a of marker 140. He's rated 135 over fences in Ireland. Um, he was a neck beaten to Quilixios on chase debut, who's now rated 150. Two good runs after. So, look, he's going to get a few pounds from the English handicapper. Um, but, look, in the round of marker 140, he's always looked like a horse that could improve for fences. So, uh yeah, I think there's 20s out there in the market at the moment, cool survivor. It's not as good as 33 to 1 or 50 to 1, but look, yeah. 20s anti-post. So you'll never be as good as Vernon. No, that's okay. Exactly. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> and to his point about, like, say, for example, if you're on or Frank's on, you nap something at 12 or 14 to 1, do you actually see it's 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 kind of weird? Like, would you get in trouble if that wins or anything? Or 
Um, maybe not at, at 12s. Like, I, I suppose cardinal sin really would be that, you know, if, you know, Patrick's talking about big races like the Albert Bartler, Bartlett, if you've, you know, 100 to 1 winner of that and he's a loser in the book, it's yeah. probably not ideal. Like, you don't want to be laying, you know, you lay, you know, 100 to 1 for a time, but once the liability, you know, the liability gets huge on those selections. So, um, if you do see a run of bets, like, you're, you're going to give it a cut. Um, if you don't cut it, and it miraculously wins at 100 to 1 and it's a huge loser in the books. It's a bit of a disaster. Eti Ethical Diamond might be one of them. Was he 100 to 1 after that person? He might have been yeah, put up by... A big enough price, yeah. yeah and he was kind of half fancy possibly, that. Yeah. Was he put up by you? No, the Rory put him up maybe, but uh, yeah, a couple yeah. of people had him at 100 to 1 for the Triumph post Leopard's Town, but I was hoping he was going to go for the Boodles, but anyway, that didn't work out. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, you done? I think so. Great, perfect. Okay, right. Uh, Brendan, Brendan has one for Patrick. Hi guys, my question is for Patrick. Patrick, when it comes to deciding who you ride in the bumper, is your decision solely based on what they've done on the track or do you take into account their work in the lead up to the race itself in the last couple of weeks in particular? Thanks guys. So, how do you, you choose what to ride in the bumper? Uh, it just depends. Like, look, if there's a year there when you have um, appreciated and Fasa Vegan, they bolt up in Leprestown, you're going to ride them bar they're going backwards at home or something. Um, in a year like this year, um, obviously, you're trying to judge up what the form is. You're trying to see how the form lines work out. Uh, but basically, yeah, like even last year, it comes down to the work they do at home. And so even last year, it was between It's For Me and Factor File. And the last bit of work for Cheltenham, I wrote It's For Me with Factor File. And there wasn't much in it, but It's For Me was very keen. And I just said to myself, says, he is going to be a horrible ride in, in the bumper. Whereas Factor File, I can ride him wherever I want. So I, I rode him because of his temperament. Um, but this year, I'd imagine it'll be what work, what's working best in the last week, and then I can choose the wrong one. And does it bother you if you choose? I know, like a team Mullins and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, this is the is this the one race where you get to choose which one you get to choose which one you're riding. So therefore, you really want to get it right. Yeah, yeah, it is really annoying. And I, I remember the year I rode appreciated, and all year we thought Fernie Hollow was the best of them. But again, he was an awkward ride. He was hard ride, so I chose appreciated, and he bolted up at DRF. So, um, but I was walking back in, and I was not in a great mood and Mikey Fogarty is just where you walk back up to Prater and he goes, I told you brother, I told you, I backed him at 33s or something. So, <laughs> so You were delighted for him, were you? I was delighted for Mikey, yeah. I was really happy for Mikey at that stage. Um, but no, it is really annoying, but like, it is it is hard because they've only, most of them only ran once, they might have ran twice, they're young horses, they're improving. Like you see, when you see Ruby or Paul, at the, the, mo the race they get up wrong the most often is the novices because there's, there's so little there, form. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. And do you, it is. Sorry, do you find when you go out to the prairie on the day and you look at me and go, oh God, I'm on the wrong horse here, this horse is really, the other horse really come to hand in the week or the travelling or just physically, they look better for the time? Yeah, the, the, I suppose you're looking if your horse is, if your horse is going around with his eyeballs popping out and sweat dripping off him, um, which can happen in Cheltenham, uh, that's obviously not ideal. And, you know, it's 48 hour decks, so you have a fair idea how well they've travelled over. But yeah, you know, it might be a case that they've travelled okay and you're hoping they're going to get better and maybe maybe they don't. So there are two factors, but there's nothing you can do about those, unfortunately. Is, is there signs, Patrick, that you'd look out for that maybe a horse hasn't travelled well over to Cheltenham? Like anything that people could spot in the parading maybe before the race that could give them a clue? Yeah, I mean, the pre-parading pre is huge. You can end the pre-parading watching them because they're down there usually half an hour, 40 minutes before the race, see how they're walking around. When they come out into the parading, um, that's a whole different level of, uh, you know, they're surrounded by people there. So... You want to see them being relaxed, particularly, like I was saying, in those big field races. Um, and then even in the mornings, um, you know, I'd be trying to sit in a couple of the horses Monday morning, Tuesday morning, and just see how they are down in the middle. Are they, are they, you know, eyeballs on stalks or are they nice and relaxed? Okay. And finally, to bring it all to a close, it's Sam at one for all the panel. With so many horses having gone straight to Cheltenham from well before Christmas, what do the panel think is a real forgotten horse? Right, let's start on the far left wing with Joe. Uh, I thought Wacker Clan was interesting for Henry de Bromhead. He won at the October meeting um, of a mark of 125. I think he's rated 131 now. He beat Twig that day by three lengths and Twig was fancied for the Carl Gold Cup at Newbury. Um, Wayfinder was in third. He was second to Naslam in a Welsh Grand National Trial. So the form has a bit of substance to it. Now Wacker Clan's form is a bit patchy before that run. Um, campaign mainly in the summer in Ireland and you know some of those tracks don't suit every horse so uh, look he's campaigned because he needs good ground the weather's been pretty bad this winter so if it did turn up soft at Cheltenham I wouldn't be backing him he's a good ground horse and yeah one that's been put away since October so. and what sort of race would he be going for? I think he's entered in the plate two mile five he's actually on a Thursday yeah he's entered over hurdles and nace 
uh, this weekend. Now, by the time this comes out, hopefully he'll have ran well and got a nice pipe opener and be all set for Cheltenham. But yeah, Wacker Clan. Okay, the Thursday means to be on the new course, right? So the ground will be fresher and all that. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. See what I see all my knowledge now about Chelsea. After all these years of pre preview nights. Um, Fran? Uh, yeah, the bumper. Um, the Stevens Day bumper, Leopardstown. Um, Gold in the Mountains, trained by Martin Brazel. Really, really impressed by that horse down the day. Patrick will know the form well. He rode Contigo in the race, but... This horse was talk a punch on last year when he ran for Pat Doyle. I thought he ran a cracker on debut in a messy race. He switched to Martin Brazel, owner Sean and Bernie Mulrine. They target festivals. Martin Brazel has a great record for them at the festivals. It's not really a Martin Brazel style horse to go for a bumper. Normally it's, you know, a novice hurdle into a novice chase type horse. But 16 to 1 currently with Paddy Power with a run. Were he to go there, I think he's going to be a lot shorter in the day. The form of the race worked out very well since then. Contigo won very well at Navin. And I just think he's gone on the radar because of he hasn't been seen obviously since Christmas. Martin Brazel not being a bumper trainer per se. If he turns up in a day, you can take it that he's going very well. He won't run unless he's totally happy with him. I think he's a big chance and I was very taken by him. And the man that was placed behind him be interested what you, what you thought of him, but I was impressed by him. Yeah, that, that was a good bumper. Like we mm. thought, can't go was one of our one of our better ones, and he's one of our better ones. And we got well beaten. Um, as you say, one of Martin's, you'd expect there'd be improvement mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, uh, so that Stevens Day bumper is often very good. Uh, I know I rode Fernie Hollow and Champagne Fever, and they both got beaten in it and went on to win at Cheltenham. Um, so I wouldn't give up and can't go either. But uh, that sounds like a big price for Martin's horse. Is it, a, is it a long time between Stevens Day and Cheltenham, or is that fine? For a bumper horse. Well, I suppose the only next alternative really, really is to go to Dublin Race Festival, mm -hmm. isn't it? And maybe, you know, they that decided the not to. Then, yeah. yeah, and just Martin, you got to remember last year, he two seconds at Cheltenham. Yeah. Uh, the previous couple of years, he's won the Ballymore for the sponsors, Sean and Bernie Mulrine, fast or slow. Whatever he runs is going to be competitive at Cheltenham. And I, with the non runner, non runner, no bet guarantee, I, I'd have a 16 to 1 all day long. Okay. Patrick? Uh, the forgotten horse, I, I just think appreciate it. Um, I'm a huge fan of him. I think the race he ran in the Roy John Durkham when he split the two best staying chasers in the country, Gallop and the Champs, and fast or slow was a great run. He didn't patently didn't stay in the saddles, but you know was eye catching to the second last. And I think that effort probably told on him in the Kinloch Bray. The Kinloch Bray was also ran in the middle of a rainstorm, and some horses like people can just say, "Not today, but pack this for a game of soldiers." <laughs> yeah, so maybe. But I just I think it was probably just a bit soon after after not getting a hard race Christmas Christmas. So. If you took, took his John Durkin run, you know he runs well around Cheltenham. I'm not sure the Ryanair is the, the May West race this year. just think he has a big chance. Do you think he's better going forward, Patrick? He went forward, uh, he was held up at Turles and he was forward the time before. Do you think that plays any difference to him? Yeah, I think he enjoys that. Yeah, when he made all, obviously, when he won the Supreme as well. So, um, yeah, I think, and that Ryanair, you can do that. You can let him roll forward. So, uh, I think that'll probably help. Okay, so appreciated for the Ryanair. Gold in the hills, is that what it's called? Gold, Gold in the mountains. Gold in the mountains in the bumper and the whacker, was it? Whacker clan for the plate. Whacker, and horses with whacker and they have a great record in recent years. <laughs> so whacker clan in the plate on the third And there is a hill in Cheltenham. And there's a hill in Cheltenham. Jeez, oh my God. Like, what could, and we'd all appreciate it if we want to be back to winner. Jeez, what could possibly go wrong? Um, that's it. Thank you very much to Patrick, to Fran and to Joe. Uh, and thanks to you for watching, obviously, on YouTube and listening on the pod. And remember, if you are having a bet at Cheltenham or at any other time, please do so responsibly. Um, please do subscribe to, oh, I have to say this again, Jesus. Please do subscribe to the Paddy Bear Racing YouTube channel and uh, leave us a comment and you could win the Cheltenham. I forgot about the Cheltenham you can win Cheltenham tickets just leave a comment on this tell us we're crap it doesn't matter leave a comment and you might win Cheltenham you, you definitely won't win if you say that but anyway um, <laughs> there's more info in the show notes on that uh, so listen that's it take care enjoy Cheltenham